Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Razum Pereira. Face app, an image editing app, has caught the imagination of everyone from New York to Sydney, from Brussels to Chennai and beyond. There are millions of people, including several in India, who are transforming their current photographs using the app's age filter to see what they will look like when they are old. And these people are also sharing these photos on social media. The problem, however, is that just with any other app that uses personal data, such as a photograph, there are privacy concerns around FaceApp. A number of people have raised concerns, including a US senator who wants the app investigated by the FBI for possible data misuse. The primary issue seems to be a clause in the terms and conditions of FaceApp. This clause says users give FaceApp a perpetual, irrevo irrevocable, non-exclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, fully paid, transferable, sub-licensable license to use photos they upload. Similar fears were raised when the trend of the 10-year challenge went viral on Facebook in January this year. In this, people uploaded their photos uh, from 10 years earlier to show how they changed. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze how safe are apps. Joining me on the program today are Subhi Chaturvedi, Distinguished Public Policy Professional, Kanika Seth, Cyber Law Expert, and uh, Subhimal Bhattacharji, Cyber Security Expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Subhi Chaturvedi, I'd like to begin the program with you. First, let's try and understand and try to put into perspective how safe are some of these apps that we keep downloading almost on a you know hourly basis on our phones. Um, Frank, let's all remember 1984 and uh, people thought this was uh, a utopian, a dystopian idea of cameras looking at us and you not being able to even think your thoughts before they go public. Now, when we're looking at a lot of these apps, they have permissions which they do not require and which should not be intrinsic to their functioning. So a contact management program, when it asks you for permission to access your camera, to read your text, your instinct and your response should be a firm no. Mm. Uh, while we're accessing these apps for fun, the idea of wanting to know how you or your partner would look 10 years down the line, it's greatly amusing. It's seen a lot of traction from common people to actors to politicians. Everybody's had a go and we've all had a good laugh. But it is very important that when we use uh, FaceApp as the catalyst for uh, putting this conversation forward, we're looking at issues which are largely five or six in nature. Who have has access to your information what kind of permissions are you giving if you take this conversation further we're also uh, for the sake of convenience mm. and efficiency and for saving time we end up taking up extensions and we add them to our browsers that's another very big conversation each everything that you browse whether it's in the incognito mode when you think you're supposedly safe these um, extensions are leaking data to companies whose entire business model resides on the fact that they know which sites you visited, what have you been browsing. Similarly, in the case of FaceApp, though Washington Post reached out to the CEO of FaceApp, but the fact that it is a Russian-made uh, app, the data resides um, in Russia, the engineers are there, they're looking at algorithms. So what you've effectively done is you've given not just access to an app uh, of your face, of your name and your email, though they say that you can access it without sending your name or your email. Um, and after 48 hours, they're claiming that most of the photos are deleted. Now, this is a huge um, space which is vague in terms of their privacy commitment. And let me also go back to what you just said. It's irrevocable. It can be sub-licensed and it is stored for perpetuity. So, even if you were to delete the app after you've had your fun. Once you, it's on the servers, it's, it's yes. It's, it's there for perpetuity. And let me remind you that when we're looking at questions around elections, when we're looking at questions around democracy, Democracy. So not just where is your data stored, who stores it, which are the laws, which are the countries which will be governed by those laws and then who has access to this data and for how long. So we've seen Facebook uh, budgeting in 5 billion US dollars because they knew that uh, sanctions were coming. They knew that they would have to cuff, cuff up these penalties. But the fact is that the business model hasn't changed. Hmm. You've uh, heard a lot of lip service. You've heard a lot of people say 
saying that we will be looking at privacy as a very serious issue. Right. Now, I want to bring this really important point forward. As a consumer, you need to make informed choices. And we also need to start demanding that privacy pages are not buried on page 100 or 200 of the app when we're looking at agreements. So simpler form which puts up front as to what your what's the trade off i can't say that you know we should go back to the dark ages we're we're smart consumers we use technology to make our life more efficient and productive mm. but we also need to know what is it that you're giving up so Absolutely. do you need to install the app or can you do with an extension or a shortcut which is a desktop that simulates the app mm. what is it that you're losing and we also need to be more aware and more demanding as consumers uh, what are the the negotiations what are the terms of agreement and what really do you lose when you look at these concerns and these are very real concerns sure, so sure i think i think i think every consumer can start you know by starting to read the T T tncs first and yeah. then decide whether they want to use that app or not kanika said so what is the kind of information that some of these apps really extract well, um, as uh, rightly put by Surbhi, it is a lot of information that they are taking away. Uh, sometimes even the geolocation, where are you, uh, you know, really uh, posting a particular photograph from, and uh, uh, the name of the person, the email ID. Uh, they could even access, you know, have access to your photo gallery. So they take a lot of information of who you are, who are your close friends, your relatives, what you're doing, and what is your lifestyle. And all this information could be sold. Uh, the, the point is that if there is a click wrap agreement where you go and sign, you, you've probably not even read the terms and conditions carefully, which you ought to do, and you click on I agree, and it, it just forms a click wrap agreement. Uh, you've given away all your consent for taking away all this information. Sometimes uh, it is uh, only the information that is mentioned in the term. Sometimes it may be more than that. So what is the security and who are they mm -hmm. answerable to? If it's a you know a Russian app, it's stored in say U.S. servers. What law applies here? We are Indian citizens. We have Article 21 to protect us under the Constitution. The right to privacy ought to be respected. Uh, knowing this, that the Sri Krishna Committee, just as Sri Krishna Committee, is now given the report, and there is a PDP bill which is under you know process, and there will be a discussion. We are bound to have a stronger law in the country. Nevertheless, we do have uh, some privacy laws in the country, which even today take care of the legal framework and the way uh, the privacy ought to be protected to some extent. However, enforcement is a challenge. As I said, there is no convention. You know, I've advocated this time and again. There is no convention India has signed with uh, countries abroad on cybercrime. Okay, we seem to have some technical difficulty with the line there. So let me move on to uh, Subhimal Bhattacharjee now. So uh, we know what is the kind of information that uh, is taken from the users, but how is this information then further used and processed, uh, Subhimal? So, you know, I think uh, as I've heard both the ladies, uh, it's very clear, you know, that uh, most of the apps are collecting information, various kinds of information. and you draw your own discretion about you know which app you actually subscribe or you try to avoid now there is no thumb rule as such about whom are you choosing and also so that gap actually creates more of the fear we are talking about facetime we have had the issue of tiktok now if you see one is of russian make one is of chinese make and most of the issues actually come around anything that is uh, uh, you know you, you can't generalize it but more or less which are non us but there are a lot of these US based intermediaries and apps that are collecting far much more information also as such we feel uh, you know very convinced that uh, possibly they are far much more secure. any app has its own level of insecurity it's a question of what you are passing and how judiciously you are passing now coming to your question that where does it go further despite all the privacy policies despite all the legal agreements despite whatever the uh, you know intermediary has done yet it is seen that leakages are happening leakages are happening for various reasons you know somewhere the employees uh, are passing on somewhere the entity itself is looking this as a big marketing uh, avenue to pass on and now in this age of ai everywhere this is going uh, you know big time in terms of enhancing a lot of uh, parameters for many many uh, other entities so 
I think you know as Karnika said law has to really pick up law I think uh, whatever laws we have we, we are still again waiting for some of the changes to the intermediary guidelines also uh, that were introduced in 2018 so we have to be strict on them we have to understand what the back end is and at the end of the day the technical community also has a responsibility to, to see that you know somewhere the leakages and all are, are far much better plugged or at least understood at a level where you know they do not become a really a havoc now why facetime is so popular 150 million downloads in the last uh, one week you know it's uh, it has a lot of yeah it, it 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 has a lot of humor element to it you know it's something that uh, people are able to you know see Relate something to, in yeah. the future yeah so so obviously you cannot take the advantage away of such kind of thing and more and more people getting into the net, more and more people looking into the apps, one of the easiest thing to do, you know, mobile internet is everyone's uh, flavor now. So I think we'll have to deal with it as it comes. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule in terms of this is the right method and no one can take away. It's a mix of everything, a dynamically evolving medium. Only thing is that one has to be very judicious about understanding what that app is seeking for. And if at all that is pertinent to you know what is being sought, and accordingly judiciously decide about one's uh, particular uh, dashboard right. under which you can accept what is being done. Absolutely. So before we get to uh, you know the best way forward in trying to deal with issues of privacy, data, and cyber security, uh, since the trigger is FaceApp, of course, let's spend a couple of minutes on FaceApp. Uh, so be you know so as far as. Uh, the privacy concerns surrounding this particular app are concerned, are they justified, especially considering the clarifications that have been given by, by the, uh, you know, by, by the apps, uh, higher, higher apps? Uh, Frank, I think we need to look beyond rhetoric and what is being said versus uh, what truly happens. Mm. When uh, you use words like irrevocable, you also use words like sub-licensing and you also use words like perpetuity. Um, you are now claiming as the app developer that I will not uh, sell this information further but what as a consumer you've effectively done is you've given up your face you've also given up your details many people say that they've not shared their email but many of them insist that yes they've put in their email they've put in their data and this is now gone on their cloud uh, so even if you decide to delete this app uh, your information is not going away. Your information stays with them. The alternate which has been suggested is uh, they've not been able to figure out a better, more user-friendly way of uh, deleting all your information. So they're saying go to support and say bug and say privacy. Mm. And then we're going to look into it and we'll start removing or fleshing out your detail. Now, if we look at some numbers, India has got about 940 million unique mobile connections, about 450 million people are online. And now with Geo, data has become inexpensive. Our consumptions have gone up and most of our first experiences on the internet are for entertainment, whether it's you YouTube or whether it's looking for songs or whether it's making videos, our experience now in terms of digital literacy needs to be enhanced. And if I were uh, looking at these issues and we do that with a lens, we do that with focus, I would be very concerned. When you give up your rights, you're also creating a digital footprint. You're also allowing. So you asked before what happens to this data. Every single site that you visit, every um, uh, conversation that you have, the moment you've got extensions, the moment you've given access to your cameras, um, these fears are not unreal. This data is being sold to people whose business models rest on consumer choices. They want to know you, they want your voice samples, they want your face samples. So if I were to paint a picture, if uh, many neighborhoods are now putting in CCTV cameras, uh, there are products which are also allow CCTV cameras and doorbells. We need to get into this conversation much, much deeper because they're opting in voluntarily to share this information and these images with law and order enforcement agencies. Now, if all works well, you're enhancing safety of a community. But if it doesn't, what you're effectively doing is 24-7, you're giving access to your neighborhoods, your communities, who's visiting. And then you're also giving access to the 
choices that you're making. Mm. Our fears wouldn't be unreal when we say that foreign actors, state-sponsored or non-state actors have meddled in democracies. We've just had elections, the biggest elections that we've seen across the world, even bigger than the US, if I might add. Um, there's a lot of money that gets exchanged. Opinions, issues and causes. Uh, so not are you, I Noam Chomsky's words, manufacturing consent. You're also manufacturing outrage. You're also manufacturing hatred. You're also manufacturing dissent. So what kind of, and we've seen this with popular social networking apps, right. that whether on your timeline, whether you're going to feel happy or sad, those experiments have also happened. Mm, so mm. Uh, my larger worry is, a, you're not just giving up privacy. You know, one of the famous professors said, if somebody were to project what's on my WhatsApp in the classroom, I wouldn't have an issue because I'm not anti-national. The framing of this conversation that I have nothing to hide, so therefore everybody should have access to everything that I do, is a very scary, very slippery slope. Sure. Therefore, when we talk about legal frameworks, in a country like India, which is opening up its economy, there's reciprocity. We need to be very careful as to what kind of a draft we want. Uh, and there has to be enough and more public stakeholder inputs going into this draft. So while the report is really commendable, uh, but the draft has not seen any discussions or open houses so far. So we need rigorous debate. We also need to be very careful. Uh, I have this t-shirt rule. Whatever I'm not putting up on my t-shirt is not going up on my social media accounts. So opinions, your digital footprint and what you would share and what you would not share, you need to be very careful about it. Sure. Sure. All right. So, Kanika said that having been said, that so what's what's the best yeah. way forward then? Do we need better policies? Do we need better laws? How do we safeguard against this particular issue? So, we can't uh, deny access to technology. It will only grow and uh, we should be happy to take on a AI and uh, machine learning and other you know newer technologies today. However, uh, the social media rage as it is, uh, we should be you know beneficiaries of it rather than feeling victimized by it. So I, in my view, it's very important to regulate uh, social media to some extent, especially when it comes to child pornography. There have been efforts uh, recently, you know, there was a judgment also by uh, the Supreme Court on it. So we have uh, made certain efforts. Government is probably you know, using uh, DNA, photo hashing or other mechanisms to control the spread of this uh, cyber pornography, especially child pornography. Similarly, when it comes to fake news, there have been some advisories but uh, or it is if it is blue whale for for instance we need to however make a good uh, regulation rather than just come up with advisories as and when required so that has to be a very strategic and a very thought of process uh, and in in compliance with law of the land so that's the need of the hour according to me and we should gear up for doing this while we balance the rights and you know duties of citizens stakeholders industry uh, the the intermediaries who are you know, hosting companies or even uh, the manufacturers of this content. So it's important to balance out all, all of that while respecting the rights of privacy of uh, citizens as well. So that's how I feel about it. And uh, one should have a progressive approach rather than a regressive approach in today's world. Okay, have a progressive uh, approach and not a regressive approach, especially in today's day and age, is what Karnika Seth is suggesting. I'll just come to you before that. You know, Subhimal, uh, on this issue of artificial intelligence, so as apps get smarter, can new technology also be used to try and address cyber security issues? Absolutely. I think, you know, that's always the intent and, and on many direction, AI is also being used to bolster cyber security. Now, along, along with the, you know, technological push that is being looked at cybersecurity, I think, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love the term that she used, you know, we should be progressive and regressive because uh, you cannot stop the apps, you know, getting in more more new apps will coming in and everyone will bring its own share of uh, happiness and sadness and maybe even the Uniqueness. Risks. Yes. But <laughs> what is also important is what are we doing in terms of... Uh, uh, more than the legal part, some of the aspects how we can regulate or how we can have, uh, you know, a certain sense of comfort having it in the country. For example, data localization is being mm. spoken in a big way. There is a lot of opposition from all the big players uh, that, that, uh, that are there in the world in terms of uh, all the large American companies. So, now how are we going to take it forward? Because 
at the end of the day you know as she mentioned about digital footprints everything is going out getting stored somewhere uh, we are assuming that you know in fact many of the data uh, arguments again the data localization is that uh, security might become an issue even more of the data localization happens in India. I don't think so. I think what we also need to be very, very careful is that how we are able to handle this data, particularly the whole aspects of where do we store them, who has access to them. I don't think our track record with Aadhaar is bred. That is a good example, you know, whatever anyone might be complaining about, but we have a repository that is uh, still clear, clean and possibly you know, in my lifetime, we won't see that can be breached. So I, I would think that some of the steps that we are taking, the mix of law, the mix of regulation, the um, enhancement of uh, technological uh, standards and all, I think that's a direction uh, that will keep us still in the progressive uh, path. And I don't think that, you know, we should really become fearful or uh, I think more essential is to build the alertness and that alertness is a big time you know ppp nature kind of an activity where all the app providers all the you know people who are now allowing us for example the banking sector what is really the investments they are making in reaching out to the consumers about uh, how you know how, what should be a best practice and also these are the kind of things that we should foster because after all more and more people are going to come to the net and one of the first points of coming to the net is through the apps and again through the apps that she mentioned about entertainment part so the easy things you know that we can see attracts us more and uh, people are very gullible you know the innocent simple people who are coming to the net his his last worry is about securities people who get used for to convenience it, first absolutely people who get used to it then think of security and all and then too you know there are a lot of legacies absolutely so, and especially when we're looking at digital india as absolutely. well and giving it a push these are some issues that yeah. will come up and have to be addressed so since we are here closing comments now from all my guests with the best way forward and how we can you know get a mix uh, get a good balance really as far as this particular issue is concerned um so be starting with you Thank you, Frank. Frank, I think I've been a huge votary of the internet and uh, its interoperability, its universality and most of all, the ability to innovate without permission. And there's a term for it, it's called permissionless innovation. We've seen uh, responses of governments in most cases. Uh, they've not really engaged with internet as a space. As far as telecom is concerned, we've had a huge success. Now, when we start looking at internet governance, whether it was the Muslim Nagar riots or the Bangalore Northeast exodus that happened, the response is usually to control. Um, and I think while we'd all like to see the internet um, in some form or fashion being regulated, we need less government and more governance and we need to look at light touch governance. So you cannot really regulate the internet. What is important is create more avenues and more opportunities where stakeholders and I think it's incumbent upon civil society, media, private sector, academia to engage with the government on an everyday basis. What is of great news is uh, the government's focus on digital, on jam, the tyranny and the open stack which has made many innovations possible. So I think they're listening. I've seen bureaucrats who are very welcome and forthcoming and if we can inform and engage and constantly make people aware that this is how the productivity, safety and security can be enhanced. This is the most beautiful and the most liberating thing that we can have as a tool for measure. So let us be progressive, let us embrace technology, let us also put India first and let us look at internet as a global whole and not a sum of its parts. Absolutely, embrace technology and be careful as well going forward. Uh, Karnika? important okay. for us to educate the children especially the you know school students at this point the young generation is using these apps uh, time in day out and it's very essential to give them the right netiquette and best practices education number two it's very important for the experts to be a part of the ppp discussions as uh, you know again we were discussing that it's very essential for the practical experience of the challenges faced by internet to have uh, a say or to have a consideration while framing these laws. 
and many times when uh, you know their government is sitting and uh, discussing these laws maybe the right stakeholder engagement is uh, not represented that's very essential to have those experts from various industries come and talk about it and that will lead to a successful uh, you know implementable law that's how i feel about it we okay. definitely need to be progressive not regressive as i said Okay, all right. And uh, so we want to close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Well, I think, you know, both laws and technology uh, need attention. Their intermix also needs a special attention. I think the personal data protection bill as well as the, you know, the draft intermediary guidelines, they really need to move in fa first. I think within the intermediaries laws also the provision, one particular provision of having a presence in India with more than 50 lakh subscribers, that's a good move, but there would be far much more intervention that has to be made uh, from a legal and regulatory perspective. Uh, the reach of uh, technology, the explanation of uh, basic technology to the masses, uh, to the vulnerable sections is very, very crucial. And most importantly, again, I repeat what I said earlier, I think uh, an outreach program to educate people, you know, as, as and as more and more people get in that is very very crucial so somewhere that funding mechanism whether through csr whether through the government machinery or you know public sector undertaking the corporates everything they have to get involved in this otherwise the whole uh, story of uh, you know digital india will have too many hiccups you know to be responding to and reacting to rather than moving progressively all right, on that note, then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.